you know more than your fair share about that, and um, and in particular about the New York Times. You've had a couple of interactions with them that are pretty interesting. When you were young and fighting abroad, not that you're not young now, <laughs> um, you took issue with them revealing some details that endangered our troops, and you spoke out in a way that I think was it put you on the national map and would lead to you ultimately getting elected as a House representative before your term as a senator. And so you go back to the New York Times in June of 2020, weeks after George Floyd. And you spoke out, wrote out about the lawlessness going city to city in America. And it was very brave of you because this was a time at which there was only one right thing to say. And that was what happened to George Floyd was wrong. The lawlessness is a just reaction to what was done. And if you don't see it that way, you're a bigot, you're a racist. So for you to write this piece took took guts. To remind the audience, here's just a sampling of what you wrote. The New York Times opinion, the, the op-ed board, titled it as follows. Tom Cotton, colon, colon, send in the troops. That's not, that doesn't represent what you actually said. You were talking about bands of looters roving the streets, about uh, the businesses getting smashed and emptied by these folks and being allowed in by feckless politicians who wouldn't do anything. Rioters running over officers with cars on at least three occasions and so on. An orgy of violence um, in the spirit of radical chic and so on. Then you wrote, one thing above all else will restore order to our streets, an overwhelming show of force to disperse, detain, and ultimately deter lawbreakers. But local law enforcement in some cities desperately needs backup, while delusional politicians in other cities refuse to do what's necessary to uphold the rule of law. You go on. The pace of looting and disorder may fluctuate from night to night, but it is past time to support local law enforcement with federal authority. That's That was your position. Support the locals, like the National Guard, et cetera. That's something that we can do at the federal level. It was not send in the troops, martial law, the army's going to take over your city. Uh, that's how the left reacted to it. All hell broke loose after this thing got published. The guy who... Um, who was basically the head of the uh, New York Times editorial page, James ben Bennett, was forced out. They forced the guy to hand in his resignation. He um, He's the editorial page editor. He was forced to resign. Dozens of times journalists voiced their opposition to them publishing the piece, tweeting out the headline, the caption, in a form of the phrase, and said as follows, quote, running this puts black at New York Times staff in danger. Just your opinion. Put them in danger. James Bennett, forced to resign, said, I hadn't even read the essay before I published it. Um, and then top editors at the Times apologized to the Times staff in a long, tense internal meeting, acknowledging that they had invited you to write this piece because the Times, although always left-leaning, used to at least try to include differing opinions. So what, what was your reaction to that at the time? And then I'll get to what James Bennett is saying now. Yeah, there, there were some amusing ironies in that episode, Megan. As you say, I, I didn't even propose to write that op-ed for New York Times. I proposed a slightly different op-ed. I'd expressed these sentiments on Twitter, as we were discussing in the last hour, uh, and some anonymous low-level Twitter functionary threatened to permanently delete my account if we didn't apologize. Now, fortunately, as a United States senator with a team of gifted communications professionals, we were able to push back on it. But imagine what normal Americans do when they just have to stand up for themselves to some social media giant. Um, I proposed to write about that and what Twitter had done trying to censor my views. The New York Times though, asked me to write about the content of the argument that I'd posted on Twitter, which was very simple, that although law enforcement is primarily a local and state function, if you had local police forces that were unable to get control of the rioters and the looters and the arsonists, or in some cases, unfortunately, you know, they were not allowed to get control of them by Democratic mayors and Democratic governors, then the president had an obligation. And he had the power under what's known as the Insurrection Act to use federal forces to restore order to America's streets. The Insurrection Act is one of the oldest and most venerable laws on our books. It goes back to the founding era. 
Um, it, it's not commonly used, but it's been used multiple times in American history, most recently in the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. It was used in my home state whenever Orville Faubist, our, our racist Democratic governor, refused to integrate Little Rock Central and Dwight Eisenhower sent the 101st Airborne to ensure that those black kids could go to school and get an education, despite Orville Faubist and the Democratic Party's refusal to allow schools to integrate. Um, but as you say, the headline is the most incendiary piece of the whole story. And I didn't write the headline. As you know, as a lot of your viewers may know, authors don't write their own headlines. That headline was chosen by the New York Times. And I think that contributed to a lot of the meltdown at the New York Times newsroom because you had people who didn't even read the article itself. They just responded to the headline. Uh, my reaction but wait, to it- But wait, let me ask you something on that. Let me ask something on that. I, I posit to you that they ha would have reacted exactly the same way had they fully understand what you were understood what you were saying. Well, they might have. They they might have because again they they were so swept away with this radical ideology at the moment. These riding this riding in the street, uh, tearing down statues of our heroes, condemning America and our police forces as systemically racist, saying that we're an awful country that we're founded not in freedom but in bondage. We're founded not in 1776 but in 1619. Um, I, I mean, it was really a mob mentality. Uh, and you saw the mobs playing out in the streets. Now, again, I, I found the whole thing slightly bemusing to watch all of these, you know, social justice warriors at the New York Times melt down. But most disappointing was that the leadership at the New York Times didn't have the nerve to stand up to its own 20-something workforce. Right. Uh, Jim Bennett, the op-ed editor who you mentioned that lost his job, is not really a villain here. He's expressed regret that he agreed to the editor's note uh, on my piece, which you can still read today. Uh, he was forced to do that by the Salzburgers, the owners of the New York Times, who are the real villains, along with the woke workforce at the New York Times. Now, one, one funny story about that uh, editor's note, and, and I like to tell this story on the campaign trail and always gets lots of laughter, is that uh, they said my, without citing any factual problems, because there are no factual problems in that op-ed, they said that I didn't meet the New York Times standards. And, and I agree with the New York Times for once. I did mm -hmm. not meet their typically very low standards. I far exceeded their standards <laughs> in my quality of argumentation. <laughs> That's um that, right. They made they made him attach an editor's note, drawing into question uh, their decision uh, to to publish it. They said, okay, uh, this is just an example an example of what they what they posted. It's long, but I'll give you some highlights. Uh, we have concluded that this essay fell short of our standards. It should not have been published. The basic arguments advanced by Senator Cotton, however objectionable people may find them, represent a newsworthy part of the current debate. But given the life and death importance of the topic, the senator's influential position and the gravity of the steps he advocates, the essay should have undergone the highest level of scrutiny. Instead, the editing process was rushed and flawed and senior editors were not sufficiently involved and so on and so forth. And they go, I mean, they pull out like these, there's a bunch of BS objections that they try to come up with. Well, what's interesting now is that... Um, I'll get to Jim Bennett and his thoughts on this. I think it's very interesting now he's come out and hit the Washington Post, I'm sorry, the New York Times for doing all of this. But Eric Wemple at the Washington Post has come out with a really thoughtful admission and piece on all of this. This is just on, uh, I guess it was Thursday, 1027, whatever that was, and says, um, James Bennett was right, because he's talking about James Bennett ripping on the Times for the, how it handled this now. He says, it's long past time to ask why more people who claim to uphold journalism and free expression, including um, the Eric Wemple blog, this is Eric Wemple writing, did not speak out then in Bennett's defense. It's because we were afraid to. And he goes on to say, citing somebody who I guess used to work in your office, um, that, that they believed that the guy basically had the guy, you know, like when they reviewed the piece to try to find something wrong, they had a gun to their head to try to find something, anything. Uh, and even Eric Wemple writes the review did not deliver the factual bloodbath alleged by critics. At best, it, it flagged a misquotation that should have been rendered as a paraphrase. Heaven, heavens to Betsy. Uh, and he goes on to say, this is what the New York Times did. They published an opinion by a U.S. senator and possible presidential candidate advocating for a lawful act by the president. And uh, Eric Wemple writes, our criticism of the Twitter outburst comes 875 days too late. Although the hollowness of the internal uproar against Bennett was immediately apparent, we responded with an even-handed critique 
of the Times is flip-flop, not an unapologetic defense of journalism, which is what the situation required. Now, all this time later, James Bennett, too, comes out, Senator, and says, the publisher, Salzberger, blew it. He blew the chance to make clear that the New York Times does not exist just to tell progressives how progressives should view reality. This was a huge mistake and a missed opportunity for him to show real strength. He still could have fired me, but he didn't need to handle it this way. He says, I regret that editor's note. My mistake there was trying to mollify people and goes on to say the Times wants to have it both ways. They want the applause and the welcome of the left. And now there's the problem that on top of that, they signed up so many new subscribers, he means during the Trump era. Um, And the expectation of those subscribers is that the Times will be Mother Jones on steroids. So interesting to have these, you know, they're left-wingers. Eric Wemple's more left-leaning, certainly Jim Bennett is. Come to Jesus on this issue. You know, they the one guy got canceled. The other guy feels bad about not being honest about it. All this time later, they're starting to see the light. Yeah. Um, you know, as I said, I mean, I don't really fault Jim Bennett. I, I wish he had not agreed to run that editor's note or at least not agreed to be associated with it, but he regrets that as well. The real villains here are the owners of the New York Times, Salzburgers, and their work, work workforce uh, who don't want to hear anything contrary to their own doctrinaire progressive worldview. My views in that op-ed are not just that the president should take a lawful act if necessary to restore order. They were also supported by a wide majority of Americans at the time. Um, I just point out a couple of things. I mean, the New York Times is like the high cathedral of liberalism in America. Every lefty kid who ever wanted to be a journalist dreams one day of growing up to work at the New York Times. Um, the Salzburgers could have easily told all of those whiny little social justice warriors, you'll get back to work and there'll be no more discussion about this or you'll be fired tomorrow. And if they did say that, there'd be 10 more people, maybe 50 more people equally qualified lined up for any person's job who is willing to quit over that op-ed. Second, Mm -hmm. uh, about this Washington Post story, which does a pretty good job of laying out what had happened behind the scenes. It talks about how we went through a rigorous fact-checking process with the New York Times, just like I did with my two previous op-eds in the New York Times that talked about the advantages of buying Greenland to the United States or why we killed Qasem Soleimani, Iran's terrorist mastermind. Same exact process. It really was uh, a kind of witch hunt trying to find something wrong with the op-ed, which they obviously didn't do. But finally, two years later, after you have uh, these writers on the left coming out and saying, we were scared, we should have said this at the time, um, you know, we didn't agree with this, it just raises the deeper question, what are they suppressing today? What news are they not publishing? What viewpoints are they not allowing onto their pages? Because they have mm. the same kind of partisan filter on their news and their opinion pages that they don't want to do anything that will upset the progressive left in America. I think it's well worth asking, what are they censoring and suppressing today if they're admitting they were doing it two years ago? You know who doesn't have spooky meats? Good ranchers. They deliver America's best meat and seafood to you year-round. No costume of labels, no gimmicks, just great meat that shows up right at your door. Their October feast special just got even better. You can get up to four pounds of meat for free. You order any box, get over two pounds of their better than organic chicken breast for free. If your order is over 300 bucks worth of delicious meat, you'll also get two pounds of their Wagyu ground beef thrown in as well. Head on over to goodranchers.com slash Megan to claim your special October feast of four free pounds of meat today. Join the tens of thousands of Americans getting 100% American meat delivered right to their door. Store-bought meat can be tainted with scary bacteria and with ghoulish inflated prices. Good Ranchers lets you save $25 on every box and lock in your price when you subscribe. Put an end to your meat-buying nightmare by visiting goodranchers.com slash Megan to get over four pounds free of high-quality beef and chicken. The real monster isn't under your bed. It's really in your fridge. Take control over your food with an October feast from Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.